Hey guys, what's going on? Mike, Kevin, Phil Crafts Revival. We're actually at the Sawmill Training Complex in Lawrence, South Carolina. Thanks to our good buddy, he brought us out here and we decided to train here doing pistol, carbine, and you doing a DMR course. Long range carbine, yep. Long range carbine. You keep Long range carbine. You keep going. Long range carbine. You keep going. I know, I'm sorry, man. It's not DMR, man. There's, some, there's a cooler name for it. Long range carbine. So what we're doing today is we're focused on two-man CQB. Now, the last time we talked to you about CQB, it was as a singleton. You know, remember CQB, close quarters battle is a collective task, but you need to understand fundamentally how to operate as a singleton or an individual before you culminate and start bringing people together. So today we're gonna to talk about principles of two-man CQB, not three-man, not four-man, not one-man, but two-man CQB, and it could be one man, whatever. Uh, we have the international team, Korea, Team Korea and Team Ireland, and we're gonna focus on CQB and the advantages in this next video. Here we go, guys. All right, guys, so CQB with multi-team, multi-floor, breaching, all can be extremely compli complicated. But if you keep to a certain few principles and rules, you ramp up to that, you do single man, two man, three man, four man, multi-team, but you get to there eventually. All right, so we're gonna go through a couple of rules in CQB. The first rule is the number one man is never wrong, okay? So what that means is, if, if I go left, Mike goes right if I'm the number one man. So number one man is never wrong, so Mike, I need a raise. Huh? I need a raise. You need a raise? <laughs> number one You're man, never, never wrong. wrong. I'm done. <laughs> I think what's important to talk about when we, we think about the number one man is remember you can't see through his eyes. It's like putting the advance or reconnaissance element in front of you and trusting their instincts and their observational skills. If Kevin's the number one man here, he's gonna see things that I can't see and we don't have time to debate decision-making. I just need to flow, fit in the spaces, what? And then focus on going the opposite direction to mutually support the number one man. As you can see, like, I mean, the more people you get, the more complex it can be, but I'm here to support the number one man. And what's crazy, which is actually what's cool, is the number one man's never wrong, but you could be the number one man after being the number two man instantaneously. So there's no definitive role or task organization. We have to flow together, and whoever takes that position as the number one man is going to be the right person to follow as number two. That yeah. makes sense. Sometimes uh, where people get into trouble is they expect the number one man to go a certain way and they've been pre-programmed, but you don't know. Like if I'm entering this room and Mike expects me to go left because that's the, the open part and we have a door here, I might have heard something behind this door. So I immediately button hook and check the door and he's got to be ready to flex off that and clear this unseen part of the room. Um, so number one man's never wrong and you go the opposite way and cover his back and get in directly behind him so he's not exposing his back to a threat. Hey guys, what's going on? Mike and Kev again, we're here at a doorway. This is a threshold otherwise known as the fatal funnel. Look, this particular doorway has a wall on one side and a point of domination or unknown spot on the other side. This would be considered a corner fed room. Center fed, simply in the middle of the room, two points of domination. I don't know these angles unless I get the angle, which means I have to change my approach to the doorway. We talked about this in single man CQB, but with two-man CQB, it's even easier because I can mutually support my partner by providing what's called cross coverage. We're gonna talk about cross coverage, getting the angles as well as stepping center of the room. So this time, Kevin's coming up on the doorway. He's gonna push across the doorway, providing cross coverage to get that alternative angle. Remember, two is one, one is none. He sees the corner that I don't see. With that being said, I don't need to verbalize 
the potential threats or non-threats because my actions dictate that. It's non-verbal communication. I don't have to say clear. You don't want to be talking out loud when you're doing single man or two man or any kind of CQB for the most part because being surreptitious, being quiet is an advantage. Surprise, speed, violence of action. Surprise. Um, so I don't know this is a corner fed room because I don't have the angle, right? But he can control the preference of who's going to go because he could step center prior to me. So I got, we got cross coverage because we have the angles and then he's going to commit to stepping center. All right. So what's interesting about this take is look, when he steps center, we don't have to prioritize who's going to go ahead of time. The number one man is going to take control because maybe he sees something that I don't see. Well, he saw, for example, that he had a wall. I don't know he has a wall. He doesn't have a wall. He doesn't have to say corner fed room. All, all he has to do in his actions is step center, right? And when he steps center, I let him step center because I'm giving up that threshold. And then he steps into the room to the path that he wants to follow. Remember, the number one man is never wrong. We already covered that, but that's important. When he steps center, this is the tactic. We used to go in and flood the room. There's a couple controversial like discussions about tactics and why we did that. One, one is maybe if we clear into our point of dominations and pour into it, it distracts the person from killing the hostage. And then the center guys clean up the center and, as a tactic. We've gotten away from that because when you're fighting bad guys who have tactics, that blow themselves up or barricade themselves in the back of rooms, you have to be able to get that snapshot. I don't think there's really any consideration besides Haas's rescue and moving to a crisis point, meaning an active shooting scenario, where I would potentially jump into that room for a thug, a criminal. Um, unless it was a rescue of someone I love, I'm going to step center, get a snapshot, and then if I need to stop or lull the stack from going in, over committing to the room, we could do it there. Remember, you're also stepping center to get situational awareness of what's going on to dictate your actions prior to entering the room. Because if you step center and maybe there's a, maybe even a filling or you hear a noise or you see a shadow and it moves to the left and you were gonna go right, well, at that point, you could make a decision at that, that go, no-go criteria. So the idea is I'm here providing cross coverage and Kevin's gonna step nice and wide is it, which, is a, which is a decision point. So he's here, right? He gets that snapshot, takes in the information, and then he commits to his point of domination. I pick it up and I'm covering him by being mutually supporting. If he goes right, I go left. If he goes left, I go right. And I'm just simply supporting my number one man because he sees things that I can't see. So we just covered uh, stepping center, but also covering the angles. On our approach, one thing you notice, you probably reference in the back of your head, and all you tactical gurus probably thought about this, why would he push across an open door? Well, because he has the barrel in line with his eyes. If he identifies a threat, he can engage that threat. It's better to provide cross coverage where we get all the angles and see 90% of the room before we enter, leaving 5% in this point of domination, and if this was center fed, 5% in this point of domination. Moving on. Hey guys, the next principle we're going to talk about is tactical withdrawal or uh, covered withdrawal. So uh, in a scenario, you've extracted somebody from a bad situation, you're pulling out, but you never want to turn your back on the threat. You always want to keep a gun pointed at the threat. So an example would be police officers hit, you go up, you medically treat him, and you've got two guns in the fight, you're pulling him back, one gun is always pointed at the bad guy. Now, as you move, you need to be smart. So you position yourself in, in a way that your partner doesn't have to cross in front of your line of fire and block your shot. So you need to be smart about that. And if he has to run in front of your gun, that's kind of your fault and not his because you left him nowhere else to go. So just it's a thinking man's game. So um, a very applicable uh, principle. And uh, we're going to demo it here in a, in a second. Yeah, the two man is the added element of the support by fire position. That's essentially a breaking contact. 
uh, escape and evade while maintaining security. You can't give up security. You just can't give it up. It's the number one principle of patrolling and a tactic we live by. So if I'm retreating, meaning, you know, defensive tactic maneuvering, I'm still offensively in the game. That means I'm barrel oriented towards a threat. And we routinely do this in different drills in uh, combat operations uh, for specific reasons. This is applicable to everybody, civilians, military, and law enforcement. Turn move. Turn move. Turn move. Turn move. guys so what we just did was uh you know we came into an open room that big open large space that we came into is uh indicative of buildings industrial the list goes on what i want to ensure that i drive home is slowest smooth smoothest fast i've actually heard people say that doesn't mean anything that that doesn't whatever cognitively if you understand what that means it means if you deliberately slow yourself down and you say that to yourself, slow is smooth, smooth is fast, because I've done it over, over a decade of special operations and target sets and everything else. Because the pace in which we go when we're activated by our sympathetic nervous system with a little bit of adrenaline, maybe a little bit of cortisol, all these different stress hormones, we think we're going slow, but we're actually going fast. Uh, I'll give a plug to some of my SIF buddies. I actually had a SIF assaulter buddy named Tommy who taught me, if you can't do CQB smoking a cigarette, you're going too fast. And he literally would do it. He would put a cigarette in his mouth. He'd walk around the shoot house and he would walk super slow, smoking the cigarette, gunning down targets. And I was like, well, I don't get it. But now it makes sense because he was able to slow himself down even though um, he was going actually fast. Because the more efficient you are in your movement, through rehearsal, through practice, the better you become. So we might perceive ourselves as going slow, but we're actually going really fast. So we need to slow ourselves down. Saying that slow is smooth, smooth is fast, will also lend itself to predictability. Remember, as a number one man, you want to be a good number one man. You're not a good number one man if you're a jackrabbit. If I'm moving around in space and then I go from this pace to this pace, then that's the jackrabbit. I'm not predictable. So I can't mutually support you as a number two man if you're not predictable. So I need you to be consistent. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. The last caveat is two is one, one is none, right? We did single man CQB and that is the worst case scenario. As a collective task, the more the merrier. I don't think it's very hard being a special operations guy or a SWAT guy moving to a breach point, looking through my EOTech or looking over my EOTech prepared for defensive action while all my mates pick up slivers of the pie. It's definitely more difficult with one man, but a lot easier with two men and one man's. So, man, I hope you guys enjoyed this. What I want to close this out on is the scenarios. We're not always offensive when we do CQB. What does that mean? Well, if I'm doing an offensive raid and I'm going to assault an objective, yes, we're offensive. But what happens for your situation when you're going to rescue your child in distress down a hallway by yourself or with two men or two people. You're doing in hostage rescue, a crisis response. So you might be doing a recovery, meaning you might blow off different things. You might walk down hallways and avoid doors that aren't pertinent to the circumstance because you hear your kids screaming. Um, or an active shooting is a great example of that where you hear gunshots. Are you gonna clear every single room as a two-man element as you go? No, you're gonna move to the crisis point. There's also the recovery and a defensive action of uh, moving back, evading back. So if I have something I'm protecting and I'm fighting, I'm essentially fighting and breaking contact from the threat. Those considerations are many, those variables are important. I encourage you to mental model the practice Get with your family, start focusing on these principles that we talk about today, 
and then continue to train. Guys, I appreciate you. PhilCraftSurvival.com. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. We'll be talking about this more in detail because it's super important. Till next time, stay alert, stay alive.